Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. One of the most famous cases in cryptozoological history comes to us from the year 1967 at Bluff Creek, California. Around October 20th, a man named Roger Patterson and his partner Bob Gimlin claimed that they had trekked onto the area in search of Sasquatch. As the famous story goes, the two men encountered a female Sasquatch, were able to catch it on film, and cast its tracks as it left the area, never to be seen again, at least not by these two. Long touted as the most compelling evidence for Sasquatch, at least visually speaking, the film's never been debunked, and we keep just finding more interesting things about it ultimately. But today, I'm not going to do the typical analysis of the footage itself, although that will be involved to some degree. I'm going to talk about a specific third individual who, whether or not it was in the fashion he claims he was, is certainly involved in the Patterson-Gimlin case. I'm talking, I'm sure all of you know, about Bob Hieronymus. Before I get into exactly who Hieronymus is, I want to go over who Patterson was and who Gimlin is. Roger Patterson had long been an admirer of the subject of Sasquatch. He was infatuated, one could say, with the subject, but he also took it very seriously. He had known Bob for some time, and after investigating the matter himself for a bit, ended up asking Bob for some help with the project, which was going to be a Bigfoot documentary. The reason Roger asked for help was because he had spent most of his earnings already on the project. Bob, being a friend of Patterson, although he was skeptical, agreed to go with him to the Bluff Creek area to begin filming. According to the two men, there they encountered the famous Patty, the alleged female Sasquatch in the footage. Apparently spooked by the animal, Roger's horse threw him from its back, and Roger filmed the animal, trying to keep up with it, while he told Bob to quote-unquote cover him, in case things got bad. Luckily, however it went, nothing did go bad, and the film became part of history. It also, however, became a very personal history, not just in the public eye, but in the eyes of Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin's families. Roger unfortunately died of cancer sometime in the 70s, I believe. And although that there are stories floating around that he did, there was actually no deathbed confession by Roger Patterson that the film was a hoax. Whatever Roger knew about that footage that he didn't tell the public, he took to his grave. This common mistake is derived from the fact that he did admit to Bob Gimlin that he had used a double for Bob often at conferences because Bob couldn't make it most of the time. Bob, who is still alive and in his 90s, maintains that the footage is real. He also maintains that the footage has destroyed his public life and it nearly destroyed his marriage. The ridicule that he got from the public was so immense that his wife and he almost split several times because of it. This is where Bob Hieronymus steps in. Bob Hieronymus, who was a neighbor of Bob's, came forth in 2005 as one of the multiple people at that point who claimed to be the man in the suit in the Patterson-Gimlin film who helped them hoax it. According to Hieronymus, he had been offered roughly $1,000 by the Patterson family to carry out this hoax. And he describes a scenario as you would expect he was told to walk across the creek, did the same as turn back when he was told to, and when they were done filming, they told him well done and sent him on his way. According to Bob, the reason that he came out so late in the game was because, quite simply, he had not been paid. He didn't care about PR. He didn't care about the fact that he was fooling the public. He just wanted his money's worth. That is where my synopsis of the scenario will stop and where we will begin an analysis of Hieronymus' testimony. And that is how I'm going to treat this. I want to treat this like a trial because if trials can put away people for life or even put them to death, I believe thoroughly that the same process can be applied to a claim such as Hieronymus's. In 2005, Hieronymus went to several sources, including National Geographic and a particular TV show, which I may have already showed you a clip from. If not, it will be coming up soon claiming to be the man in the Patterson Gimlin suit. I got out there and waited, and he gave me the signal. He uh, was sitting on uh, one of the, my horse that he took down there, so he took the camera and kind of went like that. You know, as you can see, the film is shaky. 
He started walking out across there, and I walked, uh, I don't know how many yards it was, and I turned, you know, the old Bigfoot look and looked at him and went on. All this time, you know, waiting for a bullet to crack through my butt. As prosecutors, you could say against Bob Gimlin or against Gimlin's credibility, this is definitely a hard hit because, well, Hieronymus is claiming that he is the man in the suit and he can even, according to him, replicate the walk. More on that later. For now, I'd rather focus on the main aspect of the defense for Bob Hieronymus, which is his polygraph test. Taken on the TV show that I previously mentioned, which I will now show a clip from, Bob Hieronymus took a polygraph test, or as is more commonly known, a lie detector test, to determine whether or not he was being truthful in his claim that not only was he offered money to be the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot, but that he accepted the offer and carried out the actions. And welcome back to Lie Detector, everybody. The abominable snowman. The Loch Ness Monster. I mean, a rogues gallery of scary creatures, but none compares to the legendary Bigfoot. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I see those creepy pictures of that Bigfoot walking across a grassy meadow, it always sends shivers up my back. Our next guest says he can ease our anxiety by eliminating at least one name from the Monster Hall of Fame. Why, you ask? Because he says he's Bigfoot. Legends like Bigfoot seem to have always been around. But Bob Hieronymus says that the myth of the giant Yeti exploded onto the scene in the late 1960s when he was filmed in a remote part of Northern California wearing a furry ape suit. Bob says it was hard work. He spent time perfecting the now infamous arm-swinging, big-stepping Bigfoot walk and negotiated the uneven terrain through tiny slits in the scary-looking mask. He says the suit was hot, too, layered with heavy animal-like fur. Bob nearly fainted from the heat of the day. No sooner did the film of Bob hit the local news broadcast than the Bigfoot frenzy hit a feverish pitch. Bigfoot, a huge, hairy, bad-smelling creature thought by some to stomp around in the snow. Overnight, Bigfoot sightings were occurring, well, virtually everywhere. Bob could only laugh knowing that he was the real Bigfoot. Bob's finally going public, even though he knows that some folks still want to believe in the legend. Really, Bigfoot, or just a big liar? The lie detector is soon to find out. Bob, you're here today with a very unusual claim, that you are actually Bigfoot. That's right. Th I don't think there are many people who have not seen that shadowy picture of this beast going through the woods looking back over his shoulder and you're telling me that that wasn't sasquatch that wasn't bigfoot that was you in a costume that was me in a costume in 1967 in the roger patterson bigfoot film yes how did this happen well i ran around with uh, roger for a while and he figured uh, that he would make a suit or have a suit made have somebody wear it, they take a film of it and prove to the world that, you know, there was re a real Bigfoot. Well, uh, I was a big, stout guy, you know, back then, and that's who they needed. They needed somebody they could trust, and uh, asked me if I would do it for $1,000. $1,000 a thousand lot of dollars, money. A lot of money then. Yeah. So I, heck yeah, as long as it's illegal, I'll do it, you know. That's right. Because it's not against the law to run around the woods with a suit on them. So <laughs> I uh, agreed to do it. So, uh, I met Roger up at his house. He lived about 15 miles above us up there. And, uh, I went up there and uh, tried the suit on. So yeah. it was a furry suit. It was, it was like a, a gorilla furry, suit. Yeah, it was a furry looking thing, yeah. And what was the head part like? How yeah. did you put it on? Uh, I put it on like a, like a football helmet. And um, I walked back and forth the way he wanted me to walk, the, the Bigfoot walk. And uh, he said, that's perfect. That's just what we want. So um, a week or two later, um, took off for California, the Bluff Creek Road where the film was made. Uh, they had a camp set up there. And the next morning, we got up and uh, had some coffee or whatever. I don't know if we cooked up or what, but and they helped me into the suit. And uh, Roger told me to go over this certain place and stand. And when he yelled or gave me the signal to do the Bigfoot walk down through there. <laughs> 
And what was the Bigfoot walk? How well, would you describe it? He, he wanted me to look kind of like a gorilla, you know, swing your arms back, you know, and take long strides. And, uh, and then I had to turn and like, uh, you know, I'm, they said that not a, no human being could turn like I did. Turn your hips, you know, as you're walking uh -huh. and turn back to look at him. Well, no big deal, but I walked down through there. They said, uh, uh, cut, you know, that's it. That's enough. And uh, it was really, really hot that day in Northern California, and I was, uh, you know, the sweat was just pouring on me in that thing. And I, I jumped down behind this, this big old tree had blown over, and I jumped in this big hole down there. I was afraid somebody was going to shoot me, you know, all this time going down through there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, uh, somebody might think you, you were the real thing and shoot you there. Anybody probably would if they saw it. But, uh, I jumped down in this hole anyway, and said, get this, and beast got the head and the stuff off, you know, so I could get a little bit of air. And uh, we got done, uh, you know, with the filming and uh, took the suit off, and we went back down to the the camp where those the, where they were camped. And uh, the next day, I drove home and uh, I went up to the local water hole where all those guys hung out, and uh, I lifted the trunk up. And I said, uh, "Take a look at this." I didn't tell them what it was. I said, "Just look at this, and do not forget what this looks like." Well. Two or three weeks later, up come the movie, you know, on the television, the film. I said, uh huh, that's what you were doing, you know. They brought my horse home the next day, I think it was, and uh, took the suit out of the car. That's the last I ever saw of that original Bigfoot suit. Why did you show the suit to those guys? Because I wanted them to know, you know, when they found out what it was, that I wasn't lying. But I really did do this. When you saw on that film, the Bigfoot image that so many of us saw and so many of us believed. What were you thinking at home all those years when we were buying this hook, line, and sinker? I was hoping, well, maybe if I keep my mouth shut, someday they'll pay me the money. So did you ever feel guilty? No, no, because it wasn't illegal to do that, you know. The first thing you notice about the clip is that despite the fact that it's a TV show, it's very unprofessional the hostess can't even seem to show the correct footage when she mentions it, let alone pronounce abominable snowman correctly. I'm not here to attack her, though. I'm simply stating that it says that this TV show focuses more on the play-up in the drama than the actual stone-cold facts, it would seem. But they speak with Hieronymus in length. He gives details in the story. He gives why he's doing this. And sure enough, they give him a polygraph test. And to many people's shock... In 2005, Hieronymus passed this test. Welcome back to Lie Detector, everybody. Well, now's the moment of truth. Bob Hieronymus is going to walk away from Lie Detector today with a brand new label. Either it's going to be the real Bigfoot or a really big liar. Here are Bob's results. Bob, you came on Lie Detector today to tell the whole nation that you are the real Bigfoot. We asked you a following relevant question. Was that you in a Bigfoot costume portrayed in the 1967 Patterson film? To which you answered, yes. Bob, the lie detector has determined that you are Bob, you're telling the truth. Well, I always knew it was the truth. Everybody that I'm associated with, I've been around, knew it was the truth. I'm glad it's over. I had the best guy in the country give me this test. Now, I can prove to the world that I was in the Patterson Bigfoot film. The polygraph test determined that he was telling the truth. Case closed. That is, case closed until you realize what a polygraph is. This is where the defense of the Patterson-Gimlin film, and perhaps even just the defense of Bob Gimlin's credibility and Patterson's credibility, steps in. The following information is imperative to understand, especially in a field like cryptozoology. Polygraphs are not the end-all be-all. They have never been, and we are still far from them being it. Originally developed early in the 1920s, polygraphs have quite a history of being updated. Most of these updates concern different methods of determining whether or not someone is lying and how they can be measured using a polygraph. Most of these methods concern physical reactions to lying, such as a change in heartbeat and pulse, a change in sweat glands, etc. 
What's interesting to note about polygraphs is that the name polygraph is actually indicative of what they are. They are many graphs. They measure many things. It's also important to remember that correlation isn't always causation. The way a polygraph is carried out, usually, is you are asked a series of what are called irrelevant questions. This is to get a base reading of what your heartbeat and sweat glands usually do when you are not getting freaked out, let's say, by telling a lie. This way, they can compare how you feel during the relevant questions, which would be the questions concerning your actions that are relevant to the situation, to your baseline reading. To make a polygraph work, you cannot tamper with those baseline readings. Those are imperative. Remember that. Because that's the main problem with Hieronymus' testimony. And it's why Hieronymus' testimony, according to already a few courts, by set by other cases, his testimony would not be admissible in court. Because the asking of these questions took place on national television. If you're telling me that you wouldn't feel a bit jittery about national television, you must be the most comfortable person on the absolute planet. But hey, it's possible. The problem is, though, is that it's not very likely. It isn't very likely at all. And it's possible that Bob Hieronymus even knew this. If you're already a bit nervous about being on national TV, and then you tell a lie, that's going to be very hard to pick up by monitoring your pulse or your sweat glands. Should, for whatever reason, someone not pass a polygraph, sometimes someone's nervous, sometimes it's simply an imprecise wording of a question that causes an individual to fail a polygraph. It makes it even harder, though, when there's no professional present. And there wasn't one. Up until around 2007 to 2008, there were no professionals in specifically the measuring of polygraph results. It was all very opinionated. Whether or not someone was lying could be so minute a change in pulse or sweat gland activity that it could differ from person to person whether or not there was actually a lie being told. There was never an institute to be taught professionally about polygraph test examination until three years after Hieronymus's national TV testimony. And if that's not enough, according to some sources, Hieronymus never had a good reputation anyway. He wasn't a very honest man, and he was an underachiever who would do anything to get by the easy way. And if a short way to fame and glory is telling a lie when he had God knows how many years, not just to learn how he could make himself pass a lie detector test, which is actually fairly easy, but to realize that if he could get on national TV, he wouldn't have to try. The ultimate damning evidence is the fact that there is no other evidence for Bob Hieronymus. It's only his claim in a polygraph test that can't be admissible in court. For those of you who have more faith than maybe I do in polygraphs, which it didn't say polygraphs cannot be reliable. They can be reliable, but they're not reliable all the time is the problem. And under the conditions that Bob Hieronymus was in, it's certainly not reliable. And to close off, I would like to mention that Roger Patterson, before he died, only three years after the Patterson Gibbon film, did undergo a polygraph test. He too passed the test. I'm not arguing the validity of the Patterson Gimlin film. I'm arguing that polygraph tests are still so unreliable and have always been so unreliable that I don't believe that they should be admissible in the case of the Patterson Gimlin film. And therefore, neither should the Hieronymus testimony. I do eagerly await to see if Hieronymus has any more proof, but if not, I don't think that anyone should be taking him seriously. That being said, until next time.